welcome to Groundbreakers with Charles and Alice Daggett. Hi, I'm Alice. Groundbreakers is a show about the history of American architecture and specifically how it's been molded by the American dream, the American character, which simply bursts with ingenuity and invention. Winston Churchill said, we shape our buildings and they shape us. Our culture and very way of life are embodied in our buildings. The way we live in houses and work in offices, the way we recreate, all are influenced by the buildings we use. Design informs everything we touch and experience. In this series, we're discovering the ways in which architects and their designs have been molded by our culture, our economics, our environment, our social and political fabric. We go from place to place through a timeline to show how these influences indelibly shape the architecture we have today. This is the American story of innovation and entrepreneurial spirit that has created our architectural treasures. We hope that as you walk around your cities and towns, you will look up with renewed curiosity and ask, how come? Previously, we examined the formulaic plantation houses of Virginia, that colony's capital Williamsburg, and the neoclassical architecture of Thomas Jefferson. We contrasted them with the more quirky residences of Annapolis, Maryland. We looked at how the Civil War dramatically fueled innovation as we focused on Philadelphia and Boston, where two enormously groundbreaking architects, Frank Furness and H.H. H. Richardson, rejected tradition and pioneered in startling new directions. Then last time, we explored Chicago in the Midwest through the work of Lewis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright. The growth of Chicago had been lightning fast, and that burgeoning growth enabled those extraordinarily inventive architects to rise to great prominence. Chicago is also the home of the world's Columbian Exposition, which had tremendous influences, influence throughout the US, as we will see today. Now we journey to the West Coast to watch the emergence of two cities whose ascent spurred the development of singular new approaches to architecture. We'll be looking at Pasadena and San Francisco, both of which blossomed during the period, the robust period of growth that was spawned by the railroads. We have with us award-winning architect Charles Daggett, who, who holds Pennsylvania's coveted gold medal of distinction. A member of the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Architects, Charles has won over 60 national, regional, and design awards, and he has written a fascinating book on this very subject. Welcome, Charles. <laughs> And you say we're going to be talking about Pasadena and San Francisco. What's with those cities? Well, it's very interesting. Um, the, both of those cities, of course, are in California. And California, as we know it even today, is a quirky state. <laughs> and interestingly enough, um, California joined the United States very quickly. Um, uh, it was... Um, ceded to the United States after the, the um, uh, Mexican War. Which was? In 1846, it became a part of the United States mm. as a territory. And in four years, it was now made a state. Mm. And what is really interesting about the statehood of California is that the state was completely isolated from all of the rest of the United States. Everything from uh, Kansas um, uh, east uh, was separated from California by territories. There were no states. Wow. Uh, and California became a state. It's, it's my um, realization uh, just recently, it became a state so quickly because of the gold. Mm. <laughs> Follow the money. <laughs> Washington wanted that gold. <laughs> and so in 46 it was a territory and in 1850 it becomes a state. Wow. It was hardly populated by anybody. Even the indigenous uh, uh, people there were very sparse. And uh, the Spanish had very little interest in California uh, to begin with. And mostly it was the missions that populated uh, California at the time. And the Mexican government uh, ultimately shut the missions down because they were Jesuits. And they had... Um, too much influence with the Spanish ki uh, with the Spanish king, and so then ultimately the Dominicans and the um, uh, well mostly Dominicans uh, re-established the missions out in California, 
Gosh. And that started the various uh, places like San Diego, San Francisco. That's what I was just They're all say. named for saints. Because those were the, 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 that, that was the, the mission. The epicenter of those of the founders. That the was mission. the missions. So um, the the uh, what followed was mostly a very sparse pa Spanish population, um, and the United States realized immediately that it could become a Pacific country by opening California up to statehood. So it very quickly brought ca uh, California into the nation um, with all of this vast territory between itself and all the rest of the country, which is also surprising. Um, and in 1848, uh, the gold was found, and that started the gold rush. And the gold rush was also propelled by the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, we had opened the West up uh, um, through uh, Jefferson's uh, extraordinary wisdom of sending um, Lewis and Clark out to explore, and then the railroads shortly followed um, Jefferson's exploration, and um, ultimately the railroads got themselves all the way across the country into California, and that was their first destination, was California, because of the gold. And, uh, uh, what happened to California was its population just exploded because of the gold. And everybody from around the world wanted to get to California. <laughs> What's interesting about it was that very few people actually made fortunes, uh, even though it attracted so many people to go out and pan the gold in the rivers. When, when you're talking about California in that period, y you're probably referring mostly just to the Bay Area, just the San Francisco area, or all over. Uh, it it uh, took a much longer time for the southern part of California to develop because the gold was up north. Right, okay. So San Francisco developed much quicker. And that's where the first railroad And went the to. first railroads got to San Francisco, and at the same time, um, they brought in the Chinese to build the railroad. Right. And so uh, the Chinese population of San Francisco swelled enormously, and... Um, uh, San Francisco uh, reached a fairly good-sized city status pretty quickly, um, uh, certainly almost quicker than um, Chicago Whoa. Um, because of the railroad. Um, and the influence of the railroad was enormous on the population of, of California and, and the gold. And last time you had said that Chicago grew from what, what number to what number did you say? Well, it was 300 in uh, 1820 or so, and it was the third largest city in the United States in the 1870s. <laughs> 50 years later. <laughs> <laughs> the dramatic growth of San Francisco isn't quite as dramatic as that, but uh -huh. um, still the gold propelled and the railroads propelled the, the population growth of that area. Los Angeles followed much later, um, and San Diego rivaled Los Angeles for a fair amount of time because of its harbor. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, Los Angeles did not have the harbor right. connections. And uh, there was a, a connection that the Spanish were using between the Philippines and San Diego. Um, and that's why the United States realized that it had a Pacific power on its hands mm. if it could get California into the United States quick. <laughs> so they did. Um, <clears throat> so what brings us to Pasadena and to San Francisco is exactly that, uh, and it's because of the railroads. And um, Pasadena was uh, known to have a climate that rivaled the Mediterranean. Mm. And uh, it was um, uh, a very, very docile climate, um, uh, sunny all the time, and um, it had... Uh, what was called good air, and um, as, as, opposed, as to opposed to, to Los Angeles now. right now, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the things that the railroads discovered was that they could entice people to use the railroads if they built what are called railroad destination hotels. Mm. Um, and those destination hotels, uh, coupled with the National Park Service, uh, created the uh, grand style um, Awani hotel type yeah. kinds of things in in um, uh, 
national parks and, and uh, yeah, fabulous, fabulous yeah. hotels. Absolutely s s incredible hotels. Uh -huh. And so the railroad began building hotels in Pasadena, which was right on the outskirts of Los Angeles. Uh, it was a suburb of Los Angeles. And they uh, built the grand hotels in Pasadena because the doctors had decided that if you had lung problems, the best place to recuperate oh, East Coast was East Coast lung problems was to, to locate in Pasadena. And so the people would go out to Pasadena and stay at the hotels and fall in love with Pasadena and its weather. And um, it, it ended up uh, uh, growing enormously because of the population that sought out the better health that Pasadena could offer at the Grand Hotels. And so as opposed to Chicago or Philadelphia or Boston, Pasadena grew on transplanted wealth. Mm because all the wealthy who were rich enough to come to be able to stay in those hotels all ended up coming to um, Pasadena. Uh, Adolphus Bush, um, William Wrigley nice. of Florida f fame, and uh, David and Mary Gamble um, are some examples of the people who, who came to um, Pasadena. I should mention about the history of, of um, California, one of the things that I looked up was that uh, I compared the, the acquisition of California as a state to Florida. Mm. And Florida was acquired as a territory in 1822. And it took them until 1846 to become a state. Wow. Whereas California became a state in four years. So, uh, <laughs> again, you just see follow that, the money. <laughs> yep, follow the money. Um, so, what happened in Pasadena was that uh, two architects uh, by the name of Green and Green, um, uh, who trained uh, in the Manual School of Arts and Crafts at St. Louis. Uh, they were born in Ohio, trained in St. Louis, and then they went on to MIT. And they apprenticed at a successor firm of um, Richardson oh. uh, called uh, Shepley, Rutan, and, and Coolidge. It was uh, Shepley, Bullfinch, and Richardson, and H.H. H. H. Richardson, Richardson uh -huh. who we looked at um, several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, they apprenticed there, and um, evidently their parents decided, like some of the other people, like the Gambles, that they should go to Pasadena. Group of brothers. And these are two brothers, mm -hmm. and so their parents took them to Pasadena. And on the way from Ohio to Pasadena they, and, and Boston, uh, they traveled to Chicago and saw the Chicago Columbian Exposition. Okay. Uh, and it was there that they um, uh, fell in love with Japanese architecture and the relationship of architecture to the outside uh, and the interior and the outside m m uh, welding together to become one. And they became fascinated by that tradition because the Japanese had a very elaborate um, building at the, the, uh, at the Columbian Exposition. And so they uh, uh, became enamored of that style. Uh, they also were introduced to uh, Gustav Stickley, uh, Stickley Furniture. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, from the uh, from falling in love with Stickley Furniture, they became very um, enamored of the arts and crafts that they had studied at the Manual Training School. Um, you, you mentioned the Manual Training School, and, um, and I, I think last time you said that MIT was the first and maybe yes. only architectural school yes. in the country at that time. But right. there were more... Uh, but the manual training school was more of having to do with carpentry and that kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, mm -hmm. that was tool making uh -huh. and joinery and carpentry um, all together. And because craftsmanship. of... Craftsmanship. And craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the, the Green and Green brothers um, married a woman who was English. And so for their honeymoon, uh, he and his wife went to England. And there they were exposed to the arts and crafts movement in uh, Great Britain, which was flourishing at the time. Oh. And um, uh, one of the Green brothers 
brought that enthusiasm for arts and crafts back to Pasadena um, as a part of his architecture. Uh, so one of the things that I thought today we would look at quickly is um, a couple of different styles. We've been talking about the federal style of architecture, uh, the Georgian style of architecture, uh, the prairie style that Frank Lloyd Wright created, and uh, there's, there's also on the English, I mean on the uh, um, uh, Atlantic side of America, the East Coast, uh, we were mostly doing buildings that were called the Queen Anne style, uh, that were um, uh, very Victorian looking, um, elaborate, um, fussy, and uh, then we also were doing buildings called the shingle style of mm -hmm. architecture, uh, mostly in Boston. Yeah. Uh, H. H. Richardson did a number of shingle style houses, and in on the East Coast we were also building the mansions for uh, for the the uh, robber barons Robert Barons, right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that Roosevelt tried to take apart, and the mansions were uh, all in um, uh, Rhode Island. Um, uh, Ashley, uh, Asheville, Cal uh, North Carolina, uh, etc. Uh, extraordinary houses, um, and so actually, the ones in Newport weren't referred to as mansions; they were referred to as cottages. Cottages, yes. <laughs> even though, even yes. though you could put ten mainline mansions into one of them easily. <laughs> um, so, in in uh, juxtaposition to that style, you see green and green. And the first house is called the Langley House, um, and that house is quite different from, although a little bit based upon the shingle style of architecture, uh, is a little bit quite different from the East Coast um, ways of doing things. Um, and it's a very interesting house that was developed uh, as one of their first commissions when they got to um, Pasadena. Um, the Winthrop Fay House is another house that they did, uh, which looks like an East Coast shingle style house. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect it's a holdover from their Richardson period, uh, period of time when, they, when mm -hmm. they studied under him or, or worked for him, mm -hmm. um, worked for his successor firm, I should say. Um, another example is the Tompkins House, um, and that house is um, um, peculiarly uh, less eastern looking than some of the other houses that um, uh, were being done at the time. Uh, the Tompkins House is another one that they did. They, they did a, a huge number of houses. The Culbertson House, um, which looks like a, a, a timber, I mean a, a shingle style house yeah. as well. Um, the Irwin House is another one, um, which then begins to show its relationship with the Japanese because they they start to integrate the landscape and the uh, and the house together. And uh, at the front entrance is a particular um, example of that uh, kind of welding of the Japanese landscape into the house um, and. Uh, uh, finally, uh, I'm sorry. We 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 look at the yeah the Blacker House, and um, there are various details of the Blacker House that are really quite extraordinary. Um, and uh, if if you look at this detailing, you begin to get a framework for their arts and crafts kind of mixture of carpentry work and um, details. I love, I love when, uh, relative to carpentry work, I love the word joiner, a carpenter or a joiner. And the word joiner really makes it clear well, that, that the wood is being carefully placed and, you know, and It's a perfect to segue to the slide that's oh, on the good. screen. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Because that shows joinery. Um, and finally, the, the Gamble House uh, was their real masterpiece. And uh, it was designed for, and as I said, it's transplanted wealth. The Gambles were a part of Procter and Gamble Company, mm -hmm. and uh, he had some significant um, lung problems, 
and his doctor encouraged him to go out to Pasadena, so he did. And uh, for them, uh, they, they, they ultimately ended up discovering Green and Green, and they asked Green and Green to design them a house. And the house is really the, the masterpiece house of Pasadena, California. Um, Pasadena is known for a lot of things like the Rose Bowl and so on, but it's also known for the, for the green and green houses. Um, and the, um, the Gamble House is a particular example of the fine detailing that they brought to uh, the house itself. And what they called that house was, it was called a bungalow style house. And at the time, the, the, um, uh, one of the Amer really big American magazines was touting um, what was called the bungalow style of architecture. And it was based upon the arts and crafts movement and stickly furniture and so on and so forth. And they were touting the, the, the uh, bungalow style house as a much better improved version of the Queen Anne and and um, colonial buildings that we have on the eastern coast. And um, in the Gamble House, uh, they very much um, uh, organized the house over a free-flowing plan, which was um, certainly influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. And I'm sure that they were aware of Frank Lloyd Wright when they went to Chicago, the exposition. Yeah. And they probably uh, met Frank Lloyd Wright at the time. Huh. Um, and um, they, they were very much enamored with his style of architecture. And so um, the Gamble House is the resultant house it's of the masterpiece. that style, mm -hmm. and it's a masterpiece. The entry to the uh, house is a fabulous doorway uh, that is, has got um, Frank Lloyd Wright's stained glass in it. It's got um, absolutely fabulous joinery. The staircase is something to be marveled at. There's no stair like it anywhere in the United States. Uh, and I talked about the, the interest that the um, Frank Furness and Richardson had with staircase and also um, Sullivan had with the staircase and with the ironwork. This was the same kind of loving detail that was uh, all about the, the, the staircase. And that staircase is, is um, one of the most extraordinary stairs ever built. Um, and and uh, you can see it, uh, the detailing, the wood joinery is really spectacular. Um, nothing like it has ever been built before. And I should say that the, the, um, the, the interesting thing about the, the uh, bungalow style is, is that it, it literally died very quickly. Oh. Because uh, it was only for the wealthy because it was so expensive. It was so work, expensive for the woodwork to uh -huh. be made uh -huh. that no one could um, actually pull it off again. Yeah. Um, and the carpentry work is so spectacular that um, it, it couldn't be sustained. Yeah. Um, the wealth needed to build those houses went far beyond the mansions. And so the average American, uh, which the bungalow was supposed to appeal to, couldn't possibly afford uh, the bungalow style of architecture. Kind of like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's, uh, you, um, you know, what's the term for his low-cost housing? You, you the uh, Usonian house. Usonian, right, exactly. Yeah. Which was supposed to be low-cost, but it, it couldn't be replicated. Well, no, they were. They were, were low-cost. Yeah, the, the Frank Lloyd Wright boasted that the, the house Including his fee cost five thousand dollars. Ah, okay, okay. Um, I'm thinking about the ones in Ardmore that turned out to be more. One of the things that uh, is interesting for the people in this audience is that uh, we have four Usonian houses by Frank Lloyd Wright. I forgot to mention that the last time we got together, um, right here in Ardmore. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And you can you can go buy them and go see them. Um, I often have um, a lead. Uh, residential tours of the main line. And uh, first on the agenda is go see the Usonian houses. So I definitely recommend it. Okay, but, well, I didn't want to take you away but from But unfortunately, the bungalow style never really got off the ground after the Gamble House. 
and the, the gamble house is the epitome of the bungalow style and the death of it at the same mm, time. Because okay. um, you needed bad. gamble's wealth um, uh, to be able to afford that kind of a, a building. And that now takes us to San Francisco. And San Francisco uh, grew out of a, um, actually was uh, first discovered by the Russians. And they were um, along the eastern coast, I mean the western coast of the United States. Um, and of course they owned Alaska until um, the Civil War and it was purchased by Lincoln. Um, <clears throat> and the Russians first discovered uh, you know, San Francisco and because of its natural harbor. Oh. And from Alaska, it's the only harbor on the coast um, aside from Seattle and a few others that uh, were suitable for the large ships. So um, Seattle became a kind of a focal area for um, uh, the city to begin to grow. San Francisco. San Francisco, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so we come to San Francisco uh, now in this new state. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that, uh, of course, um, tr transformed tra San Francisco mostly was the gold rush and the Transcontinental Railroad right. um, and the Chinese influence. But it was also the home of a great amount of invention. Levi Strauss invented uh, Levi. blue jeans, Levi. <laughs> the, the Levi Strauss, mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, working uh, garments for the gold rush. Oh, sure. Um, so if you're going to go out and pan gold, you needed to have Maybe. pretty uh, hefty uh, uh, wearable trousers. clothes, mm -hmm. so Levi Strauss created that. And in order to satisfy the uh, tastes of the miners, uh, Giardelli chocolate was <laughs> founded uh, to sell chocolates to the miners. A necessity. For, for the gold that they didn't A find. A necessity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they also invented a rather unique, because it was San Francisco, uh, way of transportation, and that was the cable car which was as influential to San Francisco as it, the elevated train was to Chicago. Oh, interesting. Um, and both were uh, considerable inventions at the time, the elevated and the cable car. Um, <clears throat> and San Francisco uh, was also the, the site of the first uh, University of California school, which is in Berkeley. Oh, yeah. And, um, Berkeley, like MIT, attracted the inventive minds to the city of San Francisco. And so um, naturally it attracted uh, uh, Bernard Maybeck, who was an inventor himself. And he grew up in New York and he worked for his father's company called Pottier and Stylus who outfitted all of the Pullman railroad cars. Oh. And uh, he went over to Europe and uh, went to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and Pottier and Stylus had a Paris office, so he worked in the Paris office. And it was in that office that he invented the reversible coach seat for a, a train, <laughs> like we see in the Paoli ro local. Yeah. Uh, the train can go forward and backward and you just switch the seat. And he invented that seat that's been on Boy, railroad cars a, for years, yeah, and what for a, a century. What a jump forward for the railroads to not have to move. They, they didn't have around. to put the, the train on a turntable and rotate them. Mm -hmm. They could take them in either direction. Uh -huh. um, and that was a boon for uh, railroading. Sure. Um, he had a whole bunch of other inventions. And because of uh, the inventive approach that uh, San Francisco had, he then decided to go to uh, San Francisco and uh, practice architecture um, in San Francisco. Um, <clears throat> on the way to San Francisco, however, he worked for um, uh, an architectural firm that was doing mostly uh, these hotels. Uh -huh. And they, he did uh, several hotels in uh, Florida that were Spanish style kinds of hotels. Um, and then he ended up 
coming to Berkeley. Where, where was that firm? Was that? Carre and Hastings was a Chicago firm. Uh, out of Chicago. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, anyway, he uh, designed those and then he migrated to uh, San Francisco. Um, and he migrated to San Francisco because he won uh, the competition for the California Pavilion while he was at Carre and Hastings. Uh, to, uh, uh, cr he created the California Pavilion at the World's um, Columbian Exposition in Chicago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just brings us back to Chicago okay. again. Um, and, and in case the audience doesn't know this, the reason it was called the Columbian Exposition was because it was to celebrate the 400th birth, the 400th anniversary of Columbus. Yeah. It was it was in 1892 as yep. opposed to 1492. Yep. And mm -hmm. um, it had a huge amount of influence in uh, not only architecture but um, uh, here they introduced the car and a number of other inventions okay. that were uh, being formed in the United States at the time. Um, and it was a, an, a major, um, it, 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 it had been, been, been hoped to rival some of the other great world expositions of its time, and it did, it certainly did. Um, so it was a great place, for, it, was, it was indeed the place for uh, inventions to be, to, to be introduced, as you say. Yeah. Um, and I guess a lot of those world's fairs were. They, yes. you, ca you came there like we do now to, uh, not, not, not Comic-Con, but whatever these things are that people go to all the time, like, like the West Coast um, tech shows every year. Sure. Yeah, come and see the new things. Yeah, I remember going to the um, uh, General Motors Pavilion at the New York World's Fair. Uh -huh. And uh, in it, they showed uh, what life was going to be like in the in the now uh, 21st century, and it was all cars and, and highways. Because uh, <laughs> for, for General Motors, that was going to be it. That's true. Uh, anyway. Um, they weren't too far off. So he won this competition to do the Columbia, uh, the, the uh, exhibition building for California. So he naturally ended up moving to California. And uh, he got a position at Berkeley um, at the University of California uh, to teach descriptive geometry and descriptive geometry is a, uh, a, a drawing um, uh, convention that uh, we architects use in order to be able to calculate um, lengths of angles and so forth. Um, you have to be able to draw things in, in um, certain ways to find out the true lengths of things. Okay. And descriptive geometry is a method of drawing, um, but it's a it's a geometric method of drawing, and he taught that. He was a very logical kind of a guy. So he suggested to the university that they create a competition for a master plan, and um, the the university took him up on that for uh, creating a master plan for the. Um, University, and as part of that, um, um, the a woman by the name of Hurst uh, oh, of I the heard writing that, fame I've heard that name. Um, <laughs> uh, ended up uh, learning about um, Bernard Maybeck and took him on as a patron. And his uh, first commission that he did was called Hurst Hall. And it was supposed to be a building, and it's a really bizarre building. I mean, truly bizarre building. Now, um, uh, you have to be aware of the fact that uh, Maybeck probably knew um, Furness and certainly knew Richardson and so forth. And so um, Hearst Hall is a, is a very much influenced building by, I believe, uh, Frank Furness. And um, the interior of the building is a giant, giant hall. And it was commissioned by uh, Mrs. Hurst in order to uh, have the um, a, um, meeting of the, the jurors of the competition 
to be able to evaluate the competition for the master plan. Oh, I see. So, so she donated came, a building yeah, to do only the that. Master plan. Okay. <laughs> it, it pays to have newspapers. Um, in those days. In those days. Um, so he designed this building, and it was ultimately uh, it was built on her property, and was ultimately moved from her property to the campus of Berkeley. Oh, okay. So the it, entire served, building. it served its function on her property before they had the master plan executed, is what yep. you're saying. And it became a women's gymnasium on the Berkeley after campus it okay. after it was moved. Um, another really curious building that he did is called the Hoo Hoo. And he did it for the uh, California Lumberman's Association as an ex exhibition hall for, um, uh, for the Columbian Exhibition. And it was a it was touting California lumber. Oh, I see. Okay, so it was located in Chicago. It, the the building was located in Chicago, yeah, okay. but it was for the California right. Lumbermen's Association. Right. And curiously enough, the building is um, designed to look like tree stumps. <laughs> <laughs> well, lumbermen. <laughs> very very. These weren't carpenters. Very they were, strange these were building. These were before carpenters. These were lumbermen. Um, Mrs. Hurst also donated a, um, a building for the town of San Francisco called the Town and Gown Club, which was a women's meeting uh, um, hall uh, for um, the, the, um, the students of Berkeley. Oh. And it's called the Town and Gown Club for that reason, and it was a, a meeting building, um, but very curiously detailed um, somewhat light green and greens woodworking details um, in that building. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating building. Uh, it was written about by the San Francisco Chronicle as being um, freakishly bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> that's, em that's emphatic. It is. <laughs> and, uh, and it was. Um, and certainly not anything like what we've seen on the East Coast. Um, another of his buildings, which are, is also really bizarre, is called Wind Tune, and it was a house designed uh, for Mrs. Hurst. And here he combines um, uh, Japanese uh, pagoda style with Gothic. Uh, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> the, the roofs are shaped like Japanese roofs, uh -huh. and the whole building is an assemblage of Gothic uh, towers and oh forms. Oh my lord! I mean, it's it's again really freakishly freakishly bizarre. bizarre is, is <laughs> pretty much it, and it also ties itself to the land in a very nice way, though. Uh, so there's the influence of the Columbian Exhibition and the and the Japanese style of architecture, etc., and it's tied in with uh, this bizarre castle that he created um, <laughs> for this woman. Um, and she uh, went on to hire, um, one, I forget the name of her, uh, the, the first woman architect actually, um, who came out of Berkeley and was taught by um, Bernard Maybeck. Oh, okay. Uh, ultimately she, had, she hired that woman who uh, was really proclaimed to be America's first woman architect. Um, so from Wintoon, um, he then was enticed, and, and um, uh, from what I understand, um, almost refused the commission to do the first Church of Christ in Berkeley, California. Oh my goodness. And um, he very reluctantly took on that commission. Why was that? I, I don't know why he, he was... Um, maybe just concerned about his own capabilities okay. to put together a building that was that public a that building. Important. I mean, the buildings that were prior to the first Church of Christ um, were um, whims of Mrs. Hurst. And they were private, well, not private, because Cook University of California is a public institution, but they were for a small community, so to speak, well, a specific the, community. And, and a specific client. Specific client, right. Right. Now, all of a sudden, he's, he's asked to design a church. 
and he designs this church. It's it's really his masterpiece, mm. um, and he designs it all out of concrete. Oh. And uh, he pours the entire building. And in the time that he's doing this, he's um, uh, experimenting with concrete. He even put in um, in the forms um, crumpled up newspaper to texture the concrete and rags and various other ways and expressing the wood of the, the form with the concrete. Wow. And, um, that's considered pretty contemporary. That's very contemporary. Um, and he was experimenting with that. Well, that was his inventive nature, um, deciding to, to crumple newspapers uh, into the form work uh, so that it would show up when you took the form off. Huh. And um, the building is a really a, a spectacular building, but um, it is an amazing uh, piece of, of um, detail work and very much in the kind of loving detail of the, of the bungalow style um, came out of the, the uh, Christ Church um, interior and it's really pretty spectacular. Um, and, and I would say also influenced by Sullivan's terracotta work um, mm. that um, probably um, kind of brushed off on. I mean, every architect at the time, and this is done in the early 1900s, uh, is, is influenced by these other architects such as Sullivan and Wright in terms of their future work. And in this case, the um, uh, interior of the building is very much influenced by um, that kind of loving detail. Uh, and also color. Uh, he's using, like, like Frank like Furness, Furness yeah. did, uh, he's using color, uh, painting the concrete, um, various colors, and they're very bright, um, and they're, they're quite extraordinary in terms of the detailing. Um, so it sounds as if a visit, if our, if our uh, audience members are in, is it San Francisco or Berkeley? Berkeley. Women? If they are visiting Berkeley, this church Definitely is go see the First Church of Christ uh -huh. um, by Bernard Maybeck. Um, it's it's uh, definitely on the visit list. There's a, a foundation that now keeps it up, um, and and um, they they uh, worked with me for the photographs. Um, so it's still it's still it's open to the public, and you can go in and see this kind of detailing that's really extraordinary. Um, that's the front entrance that's on the on the um, slide now, um, and you can see the kind of uh, influence that Green and Green also had on um, Maybeck uh, with the entrance detail. Uh, very much looks like one of their houses. Mm. Um, and then he went on to design a, a, a number of houses that are clearly bizarre. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> freakishly bizarre. Uh, the Guy Hyde Chick House is one of them. Uh, which is the most extraordinary uh, detailing for a balcony that uh, you can imagine. Um, it's, it's just got a bizarre look to it. Um, the Roos House is another one that is just off the wall for detailing um, and very much in the tradition of the wood joinery that Green and Green gave us. Um, and it is clearly um, bizarre looking thing. I mean, nothing on the East Coast ever um, was quite like what this was. So, so it sounds as if um, the world should be very grateful, the world is very lucky that he did the Church of Christ because everything else is pretty bizarre. It is, yes. <laughs> um, one of the houses that is the least bizarre uh, although a very interesting one was the Andrew Lawson house. And Andrew Lawson was the um, geo-engineer that helped to engineer the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh. And he had a house, uh, he had a lot that was in um, a park area near San Francisco that sat on one of the um, 
what's it called, the, the, a fault. Okay. And so the house had to be designed in such a way that it could sustain earthquakes. And so the entire house is concrete and very sleek for its time. And in the concrete, he embeds tiles um, and places decorative tiles in the, in the concrete, right in, the concrete. in the formwork to, once it's pulled off, the tile is revealed. And uh, it's, it's, however, it is um, very much the um, bellwether modern house. The f probably the first one. In, in what ways? Uh, in its sleekness, um, its, its um, minimalist kind of look to it, um, uh, certainly very untraditional, completely, uh, very modern, and um, I would say it's one of uh, America's first modern houses uh, that precluded all of the rest of modernism. So Maybeck went in a lot of different directions. He was all over the place. I mean, he, he really was. And his, his, uh, his last building that we see now uh, is... Not the least of which is his last building. The probably. Palace of Fine Arts. Oh, yes. <laughs> and the Palace of Fine Arts is equally as bizarre as any of his <laughs> others, only classically bizarre. And as I say in the book, a de the, the Palace of Fine Arts deviates from my kind of looking at architecture in innovative new ways because he's looking backwards completely at classical thousands of years architecture in <laughs> uh, in San Francisco of all places and uh, he's looking at it in a bizarre way because he combines Roman and Greek all together <laughs> but what did we Americans know we don't <laughs> mind that <laughs> well he went to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts okay um, so he creates this palace of fine arts which and from what I've read uh, never really contained any art, uh, but it was for the the um, the uh, exposition that they had in San Francisco at the time, and it's one of the only remaining buildings um, in the um, in the park there, the Esposito Park or whatever it's called. Um, but the Palace of Fine Arts is truly bizarre. Uh, it has a great giant domed building in this parkland setting of uh, Roman-like um, columns. And then he takes the columns and uh, he creates a Corinthian capital with faces on it. <laughs> so he's really uniquely bizarre. He then creates in these uh, various um, great columnar things, um, on top of them are nudes, women that are facing not out like caryatids did in Greek times, but in. So we just see their backs. So you see their backsides. <laughs> That's all you see. <laughs> are they facing each other? Yeah. Okay. And, um, and no one has ever designed anything <laughs> like that before or since. <laughs> I mean, it's just really extreme. Actually, I do know that building. I had forgotten that they that they faced in, but I do know the building, and it's just magnificent. It, it is. It, it's if there are only two things in San Francisco that one visits, it ought to be Christ Church, Church of Christ, yeah, and uh, the Palace of the Fine Arts. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I, it's on every uh, checkoff list. Uh, both of those buildings. Uh -huh. uh, if if you go to the hotel uh, and open uh, where to go in San Francisco. Um, they're both on the checkoff list okay. of what I should do in San Francisco, aside from going to Chinatown uh, <laughs> and taking, taking a cable car ride. <laughs> That's right. um, you should go see the First Church of Christ and the, and the Palace of Fine Arts. Um, and it, it's, it's particularly unique because it's, it's just combining the bizarre with the classical. Yeah. I yeah. mean, nobody um, would have ever thought to do such a thing as what Maybeck did. So the guy was, was uh, he was really a hoot uh, <laughs> as, as far as architects were concerned and, and a brilliant inventor. Um, he, he invented um, a, uh, a chimney system that exhausted the smoke, not just let the smoke go oh, okay. out. Um, he, he had a number of various patents 
uh, that he perfected. And this was the fellow who did the, the Pullman the car Pullman in the beginning. The Pullman reversible of, of seat. Conversation. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So, um, so that takes us to California and uh, uh, it's yeah. incredible architecture. So you're reminding me from a, t uh, from a session or two ago, of, of course the East Coast um, was populated by people from Europe and had a very uh, European and classical outlook on things. Um, and now you're referring to all the, Chi the Chinese influence uh, on the West Coast and also the Japanese influence uh, from the Chicago, Col the Colombian, the World's Colombian Exposition down in S Southern California. And I'm reminded of what you had to say about Thomas Jefferson and looking East, which means West, looking West, which means the Far East, and uh, our our growth in that our growth in that direction, our our intellectual growth, our, our uh, not just our not just our physical growth taking over the country, and, and it is interesting that you say that uh, we had no states between no. uh, between the East Coast and California nope. too, but yeah, it, this is a this is a blossoming of. Jefferson's outlook. Well, it all ties in. Yeah. Um, um, I mentioned in the book, uh, Jefferson uh, was the first um, architect really uh, to begin to connect the landscape and the building. Uh, in Europe, buildings are simply objects um, that dominate the landscape. Um, and the landscape in the European palaces uh, are an adjunct to the great palace mansion um, and, and, and all the geometric gardens that the French created and so forth um, are simply an outgrowth of the geometry of the palace mm. and not um, integrated with the building itself. Right. So when you're in the Hall of Mirrors, you can see the landscape, but the landscape doesn't come up to the Hall of Mirrors like the American House does. And Jefferson is actually the first architect to recognize the landscape. And I think because of um, the University of Virginia, which so magically cascades down that hillside, um, I think it's because of that building particularly that the landscape becomes integrated into the whole scheme of things. And then he sends Lewis and Clark out to investigate the landscape of America. Mm. And um, he propelled that investigation. And it was because of the thinking of the time. Uh, there was uh, Emerson, Rousseau. Uh, they were all talking about the landscape. And um, uh, that's what um, Jefferson's connection to all of these other architects are all about. So it's very interesting. And I'm, I'm think you mentioned the geometric um, <coughs> gardens of the palaces on the East Coast, which were very rational, very, very laid out. Well, very French mannered. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the Japanese and, and Asian seems to me to be I don't know I don't want to use the word empirical, but it, it's more it's more. They're um, very organic, organic and natural. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 Japanese setting is a much more. Organic yeah. garden. So the house it's and asymmetrical. The all it's works together it's, as one it's completely non-geometric, uh -huh. um, and is almost as natural as you can make it. Right. Um, and the the uh, Lucan once said uh, that if he was going to plant trees, he would plant them in a grid, because only God can plant trees naturally. <laughs> 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 and the Japanese seemed to think that they were pretty good at godlike <laughs> creation of landscapes. And they, and they were. were. <laughs> they were, definitely. Um, so uh, the, if, 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 um, if you know anything about Japanese landscape, you begin to see um, through the, the looking glass of a Japanese garden uh, the relationship of uh, green and green and um, some of these other architects that, and Frank Lloyd Wright uh, who connect themselves to the land. And, and talk about organic. Um, now, you mentioned that the bungalow 
kind of went out of style because it was so, so expensive, that specific kind, that, that specific structure. But um, arts and crafts continued, right? I mean, yeah, arts, arts and, and crafts, crafts continued. developed that whole West Coast. Uh, it did, yeah, and, and much of the northwestern United States is very much connected to arts and crafts and um, woodworking. And the, the bungalow style uh, became a West Coast kind of a, of a style um, uh, to look up to. Uh, you couldn't duplicate it, but mm. you could look up to it. And that would be using the arts and crafts yeah. idiom. And the, the, the um, you know, the architecture of... Uh, Washington State and Oregon and so forth uh, are connected very much to the bungalow style of architecture that we see. Um, and uh, it's an outgrowth of, of uh, green and green. Mm -hmm. their, their influence on the West Coast was absolutely enormous. I mean, it never, it never touched the East Coast, but it certainly did the West Coast. No, what a shame. It's a beautiful, beautiful application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely spectacular. Yeah. So, um, in any event, the, uh, the, 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 the thing that we will look at um, next uh, is quite different than the sort of natural looking buildings that we see, uh, and the bizarre buildings that we see out of Maybeck, but the natural looking buildings that we see out of Green and Green, and we'll see them the next time. Well, that'll be exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and those won't be, we've done the East Coast. We've done something of the West Coast, and next time we'll be focusing more on the center of the country. That's right. Yeah, as we did with Chicago. Yep. And we'll probably continue to see Chicago's influence uh, yes. when, when, we, uh, when we visit next time. Yep. <coughs> Absolutely. What, well, I'll tell, I'll tell the audience in a couple of minutes what we're, gonna, what, what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep them dangling. <laughs> um. uh, Actually, I can, I can do it right now. Yeah. <clears throat> so, next time, we'll visit a pair of cities that fostered the emergence of two architects who shaped their buildings in surprisingly sculptural ways. Those cities, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Detroit, Michigan, where the paradigm-shifting automobile sparked their growth. It was oil in Tulsa and the auto in, in uh, Detroit that, pardon the pun, fueled the evolution of Bruce Goff and Arrow Saarinen. So, please join us then when we will discover some more little-known facts about American history. See you then.